The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. G'day, how's it going? What do you know, Strike Light? I'm back in front of the mic with my good friend, Dill. Mate, how are you? Clayton, I'm doing very, very well. Besides the, uh, the flu every second week, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Uh, look, I, uh, I feel the pain. Um, so just for our listeners, the Thursday podcast is, is a bit of a takeover, a celebrity spin, so to speak. Um, Jess, who normally handles the Thursday podcasts, she's on a bit of a you know, she's gallivanting around the galaxy on an international soiree, as you do when you live the life of a flaneur. Great word. Look it up. Uh, it got sick in Morocco. And so uh, she goes, Clay, can you please fill in for me for one week? And the first person that came to my mind was to interview you, Deal, because it's almost like the birth of the podcast has followed the birth of your uh, self-employment journey. Mm-hmm. And, and and every couple of years, we we kind of catch up and, you know, it started with, you know, when we're all, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed, we're yeah, all like, wow, <laughs> yeah, get, get, you know, get, getting into this stuff. And now we're sort of a handful of years in. And, um, and so, yeah, man, I thought it'd be great to sort of uh, touch base with you, get an update, see how you've kind of adopted or, or, you know, approached a, a COVID and post COVID and re COVID, if you want to consider it that mm. way, uh, environment, what, you have found has worked what hasn't worked uh in terms of uh you know like your internal processes acquisition of clients you know quality of advice all that kind of cool stuff yeah, and sure. um yeah man I'm, I'm pretty pumped to get in front of you so i guess we'll start with um from the last interview which i guess was about two or three years ago to now we have encountered covid you've yeah. been self-employed through the whole thing what has worked and what hasn't worked yeah, good point. Yeah, good good to be uh, back on here. Yeah, I think I've done a couple of podcasts across the years. I think one of the early ones was 2017 when we all looked probably about 10 years younger, <laughs> not, not so much five years younger. Uh, but uh, yeah, look, uh, just a bit of a background. Uh, started in the firm that I own now in 2010 in December, coming up 12 years. Started in the engine room as you do or, or as you should do. Uh, mm-hmm. Get your hands dirty and kind of work out all the processes and, 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 and the back end stuff. Uh, become a part owner in 2013 and then took over the practice uh, 100% as, as, as the owner, as you say, uh, in August 2018. So coming up four years now, uh, had the COVID in there and had everything else thrown thrown my way and our, our way as, as advisors, of course. Yeah. So, um, well, the first thing I did pre-COVID actually was we had a, a fairly big office space that we really didn't need anymore uh, and the rent was going up uh quite substantially, actually, probably up to 30, 30 grand upwards. And I just, didn't, just didn't need that space, really, yeah. just that space. So I moved into uh, basically a small sort of serviced office. Uh, you probably know Regis. Yep. Uh, similar to WeWork, obviously a lot lot less quality, not as, not as nimble and nice and clean and, you know, and, and, and snazzy. 
uh, that's uh, moved in there and basically have been paying uh, sort of 10 to 12 grand in rent a year for the last good, good part of, you know, three and a half, four years. And has that worked well? Have you, have you liked, you know, having that separation between work and, and home still? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, yeah, you, you can't, you can't be. I don't, you, I don't want to be five days a week at home. Uh, it, what do? You, how do you run it? At the moment, in its current form in 2022, uh, I don't work. I don't actually officially work on Mondays. That's kind of my family day and right. kind of housework, just a whole jumble of life admin. Yep. Uh, I've got three young kids, so uh, one's in high school, so it's just it just gets busier and busier every year, um, uh, as as you know. Uh, but basically, I would tend to work from home uh, two to three days a week and in the office, pending appointments, of course, what I've got on, who's coming in, what it's for, first appointments, new you know, new clients, one to two days a week, I'm in the office. So do you find the in-person is better, like like for new clients is better in person than for ongoing, they're happy to do virtual? I always prefer if I'm meeting a brand new prospect for say an initial consultation or discovery session, I would love, I love seeing them face to face. I think they yep. love it too because you can trust someone, but you can really trust someone, you know, and you yes. can build that rapport face to face. So yeah, but I've got the office there. It's a clean, professional, small, tidy space that clients know they can always come to. There's a, it's a home base if you want to call it that. Um, and it's worked really well. I did it before COVID and, and when COVID kicked in, I thought this has just been a blessing in disguise. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have gone that way now, either a shared or a service office or, or something of that nature. So, yeah. um, yeah. Cool. And, and I know sort of during this period, you've also changed licensees. Yes. Um, what have, how was the pro how actually probably the first question is how did you select the licensee? And then second of all, do you feel like it was a, a good decision? Um, yeah, we were with Count. But when I say we, I mean me in the business and, and the previous business owner uh, was the business was with, was with Count Financial for coming up to 31 years, I believe. So long, long time. Um, I'd just taken over um, a couple of years in. Count's expenses were going up dramatically. It was going to be close to close to about 71000 for a single AR. That's with, you know, your PI, your X plan, your, your Morningstar and your licensee costs. Yes. And it was just too much. And I was looking for a bit of a, a sea change as well. Uh, I just basically talked to just a whole bunch of licensees, talked to a whole bunch of advisors on X, Y, as you do. Yep. And I didn't, I probably didn't research as in-depth or as um, aggressively as I could have or should have. Uh, but I settled for Capstone. Um, the, the savings there were, was approximately 20, 25 grand a year. Yep. Um, so settled for Capstone and, uh, yeah, I think we, I think we moved to Capstone September 11, 2020 <laughs> of all days. Um, <laughs> I moved house, I moved house the same week as well. It was a bit crazy, but, uh, two years in, um, I'm, I'm happy with my decision. I don't think any licensee is perfect. No, I, I can tell you Capstone's not perfect. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's things I don't like about Capstone. There's things yep. I do like about Capstone. But the most important yeah. thing is that they're cost competitive. Yep. They let me run my business just and let me do my thing. They don't yes. need to be They don't try to overcoach me yes. or overhand over hold me. Uh, yes. There's client support when I need it. And yep. that's pretty much all I all I care about. Awesome. No, look, I mean, honest. it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, if, if you think about um, as a part of, because we recently uh, decided – just, just with the growth of X Y, you know, we're 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 expanding into new territories, and you know, at, as you do, you kind of look at across the pond at the US, and there's a, there's a US uh, firm uh, X Y Planning Network, right? Which, uh, and I've said it a million times on the podcast, but we have nothing to do with them. It's just really serendipitous. Uh, for whatever reason, we end up having very similar names. Um, so, you know, as, as we're ex expecting to expand overseas, we're sort of changing our name. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah we have I'll, read your, I'll read your reports, don't worry. <laughs> I'm the only one, though. <laughs> um, and so, it, it, and and I, I think in my emails right now, we've just re uh, heard back from the UK, which is successfully um, trademarked over there, which is great. So, we're going, you know, well, I, I never want to do this again. So, we're doing it properly. We're spending about $30,000 and trademarking globally before before we release the name, because there's no point in doing anything unless we can get it everywhere. Right. So, but as a part of this process, as part of the name change, and I can't wait to share because it it's actually a really good name. Um, uh, we did a, a real big deep dive onto the personality trait of a financial planner, like a really big deep dive. Right. So we worked with this branding agency and, 
you know, these guys, uh, that, that's their job. They need to understand the market better than the client, in this case, us. Yep. And they came back in, they, they came back with a bunch of um, uh, like personality traits of the average financial planner. And it was, I could summarize it by saying confident introvert. And I looked at it and I went, you're so right. Like that is the, if I think about, you know, if I think about myself, if I think about you, if I think about the broader X, Y, you know, advisor community, and then beyond that financial planners all over the world, confident introverts is, is a very good summary. And, um, and as a part of being confident, um, you don't necessarily want to be told what to do all the time. And it's an interesting thing that you bring up in, in terms of capstone and, and one of their value adds is actually hands off. Yeah. 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 It is. It is. When I, when I had the, you know, you have the interviews and you do your little talks with them and you say, well, like, you know, and they give you all the spills and they try and sell the, the license seat to you. I said, look, I want to know that I can like uh, run my business, how I want to run my business and not have a BDM uh, jump out every month down my throat trying to give me this or give me that. I just want to, if I want hands off, I'll have hands off. If I want to help hand hold, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make sure my needs are known and I'll put my hand up and say, Hey, can, can someone come and chat to me? But I just didn't want that pressure um, of, of, of having to, to sort of just justify what you're doing to another level of person. This is your business. This is your baby. This, this is your, your client base. You know? Yeah. So um, how have you found staffing uh, and, and actually probably before that, do you have, grand ambitions to 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 grow a practice no. Uh, obviously no so so you, you love the lifestyle business uh, oh well whether i love it or not I, I've, I've thought about this many times you know do you go down the path of grand growth and, and expand the uh, have more ars come on and, and, yeah. and more staff and really become a mega firm i yeah. think like ben, ben nash in terms of that model and he's doing Corey, it. yeah Corey, uh, some of the people, people that I probably don't even talk to anymore. They're doing yeah. an amazing job. And if that's what they want, that's brilliant. But I'm at a point in my life um, and it's all coming from, it's all shaped from my previous or my past life, you know, being yes. married young, having kids very, very, very young, at yep. 21 at uni. And, and, and so different things shape how we want, how we want to move forward. And, you know, a, a more, more flexible lifestyle business is what's going to make me happiest. Awesome. Uh, it might not be the smartest move. Uh, it, it may not be the best fi- financially, but it, it makes me, it's going to make me happiest because anything that can free my time up for things like, but, you know, my other passions, which is coaching, uh, playing sports, uh, travel, uh, other bits and pieces, that, that's, that's what's going to make me happy. And I just want to be happy. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, that, it's, it's really good to know that, I think, because there's the lifestyle business where, and, and this is sort of generic, even beyond financial planning. There's a lifestyle business where you can work four days a week and, and there's sort of a, a revenue cap of let's call it $2 million a year, right? So that's sort of the, the revenue cap where you've got the key person and, and, you know, a handful, maybe up to a handful of sort of support staff and contractors and people around you that help you get the different parts done. Um, and then, and then if you choose to go to the next step, uh, and it, cause, cause it, it's one set of skills that'll get you up to 2 million. Right. And that might take 20 years to, 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 mm. to hit that threshold. Mm. Right. But if you want to sort of sail past that point, that's when, uh, you become sort of a, a, a small to medium enterprise. And then you're, you're aiming for that sort of $10 million cap. And so it's quite interesting, you know, even with X, Y, cause, cause we're growing quite quickly. And obviously we're, we're not aiming to be a lifestyle business. We're sort of aiming to, to hit, you know, a hundred, uh, sorry, sorry, like 10 mil. And then beyond that would probably be the next one would be like a hundred mil. Right. So in, in a long time from now, but that that's, that's our goal. And it is a totally, totally different strategy to when I was running a financial planning business. Cause I only wanted yeah. a lifestyle business at that stage. And, and it was me and a handful of people. What after all these years, are you finding is the best solution for staffing and support for a lifestyle financial planning business? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and just, I'll just, I'll just answer before I ask that question, you know, sometimes, you know, I feel bad that I don't want to push into a big aggressive, um, you know, mega firm. No. But then I think of uh, everyone's situation is so unique and so different and my kids are so young and there's so many things outside of professional life that I really want to achieve. We've been doing this 
to 12 years straight and I still I'm passionate about my clients and I love my clients but I just don't have the passion or the all the desire to, to really ramp up my my business you know skill set and, and really get out there and blow this business apart uh, it doesn't mean I don't care about my business or, or, or my clients but yeah I just thought I'd sort of put that point out there for anyone else who feels sort of guilty for not maybe stepping up to that next that next big step you know but um I think uh, it's smart to know that man I think it's smart to know yeah. what you want to do and not not try and overdo it because the fact that you understand that you you want happiness in your life and the fact that you understand that you have a lifestyle financial planning business cuz I mean at the end of the day even if 2 million dollars is the cap 2 million dollars a year is a shit ton of money yeah. Right. That, that's, that is a lot of cash. And then, and then, and then depending on how much, you know, like whatever your cost of goods sold and running and fixed costs and all that kind of good stuff is depending on what that is, but you can pull out like a very yeah. healthy living out of a lifestyle business. So if you're pulling, you know, a good, a good dollar out, plus you're clear on what it is that you want to achieve, may I would definitely uh, say that, Guilt is the last word. Yeah. I, it's smart it would be a much better descriptor, I would say. Yeah, but it's easy to, yeah, it is smart, but it's easy to, it's easy to put, it's your, your own worst enemy sometimes and and it's a perceived pressure you put on yourself. You know, that's that's the biggest one. Uh, but your question was around, ah, uh, yes, uh, staffing. Um, yeah. So the biggest thing, um, and we've had this conversation, I have had issues, uh, you know, I, when you have a lifestyle business, it depends on how your business is set up, but, the biggest thing for me is having access to uh, a person, a helper, a staff, an outsource, call them what you want, whatever you want to call them, that can help you at an ad, at, a, at a consistent ad hoc level. Mm. And what I mean by that is that financial planning does come in ebbs and flows. And depending on how your business is set up, you and this is how my business is set up, I even if I wanted to put someone on permanent part-time, I can't do it. There's just not enough there's just not enough work consistently for, for them to be doing something. And I know that sounds really unbelievable, but when you've got 98% of your clients, digital only, no more posting, no more printing, they're all, they're like totally in sync with DocuSign, HelloSign. They know the drill. They know which compliance documents are coming out. They know to expect negative returns every six years. They know that you've trained them so well to be in sync with the way you do business it, it really can be a breeze sometimes and it's only yeah. when you're busy and you have that overflow and you've got lots on in life that I actually, uh, I do use, I've got someone who helps me and she's amazing. Uh, and, um, and I, I use her at an ad hoc basis when the, when the, when the tasks are there, I'll, I will sign the tasks, they'll build up, they'll build up and she'll, she'll go and knock them off. And when the tasks aren't there, she'll, she won't do anything for me. So that's awesome. If you can find someone like that as a smaller, smaller business, that's more, uh, ebbs and flows and lifestyle based, then you, you, you're on a winner. But yeah. it can be difficult to find the right person, to find the right fit. Yes. Um, actually, there's someone in the, so XY works um, almost identical to that as, as we're kind of going through a growth phase. Um, there are, I think, eight of us employed, but there is double that again, who are contractors mm -hmm. who, who help us do a whole wide variety of things. One of them it, 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 who's, who does some great content for us because everyone that works in XY, especially on the content side of things, are former financial planners, mm -hmm. ideally really good former financial planners and ideally principal advisors and ideally even ran a, maybe even a power planning business or something like that. And, and one of the such people that we work with uh, is a uh, one of our team members is Adriana, Adriana Day, and she uh, runs a paraplaning business and does content for us as well. So there are people out there that can work in a, in an ad hoc capacity. Yep. Um, I've and, normally got other roles, like you say, as well. Yeah. You, I mean, unless you're really just wanting to dip your toes back in and just do a couple of hours here and there, like here and there, like you normally find that that person is either on sabbatical or yep. potentially uh, they've got a full time role and they just they love. But, and they've got maybe their kids are 18, 20, they've gone to uni out at the nest now. Yep. Sort of like, I'm happy to do a bit of weekend work and a bit of after hours work and yeah. dip in here and dip in there. And and, and so it, they're hard to find, but in a, in a post COVID world, they're becoming more and more common. It is true. It is true. Yeah. The, the, actually, and, and this is, this is, this might be a really good segue into the next topic, which is what does a post COVID world mean for work? What do you think it means? in terms of the conversations that you're having with your family about your own work and your own business 
But I guess also importantly, what are the conversations that you're having with your clients? What do you think? Because if I, it, you know, like for, for better or for worse, probably for worse, um, I have been on the wrong side of history and waiting for property prices to drop to reasonable levels. I've been wrong for 20 years now. Um, and so perhaps over the next couple of years, we see some kind of uh, retraction um, but basically I'm looking to buy in about two years, right? So I'm, I'm finally going to enter the, the uh, property market in about two years. Yep. And, um, and um, I just don't know where I'm going to buy because the nature of work is such that realistically two days a week in the city, it's almost flipped now, right? It used to be five days at work, two days at home, but yep. now it's almost like it's five days at home you know, working for, for a lot of that, but also, but two days in the city, in the office, it's, it's weird. Um, now think about what you can do if that's reality. I mean, I could, I I could move to tweed heads, fly in on a, on a Wednesday, you know, early morning flight, work all day, stay overnight in a hotel in, in Sydney, work all day on a Thursday, and then fly home late on Thursday night. And so what, and, and this is just sort of something that I'm thinking about. Like, do we buy in Sydney? Do we buy and live near an airport? Like what, what do you think is the future of work post COVID? Well, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. You know, people can now earn a reasonable living working from home and working from any location with the right employer, with the right corporate support. Now there is some resistance and there is, some debate about whether we should all go back or all stay home and, and what have you. But I think in the last, uh, I think two, the last two years of COVID has, has probably taught us that there's, there's been a big mistrust from corporate Australia that they haven't believed that we can, you know, when I say we, I mean the majority, the majority of good, hardworking people who can do it, who can juggle and who can put their 37, 38 hours in, right? Let's, let's, let's just like not account for the bad lemons, right? Or the yeah. bad but it, there's just been a massive, mistrust issue with, with corporate Australia and uh, the fact that it's proven that it does work in most industries uh, means that, yeah, people can actually earn $100,000 a year and not have to go into the city every day. Now, if you swing back to the 90s, you either have to be in the workshop, you have to be in the factory, or you have to be in the office, or you did not earn an income. Yeah. End of story, end of discussion. It's yeah. a totally different world we live in post-2020. post, post uh, 2020. Uh, Yeah. So I, I'm a big believer in uh, a mix of the two. I know that I get a bit stir crazy if I'm sitting around here for two oh, weeks. 100%. Uh, my partner works at home as well. Uh, five, well, yeah, four, four, five days a week. She pops into the city sort of once or twice a month. Um, and and we, we we like having that break um, in terms of just going to the office, have a new environment, fresh fresh set of eyes, talk to someone in the office, see see some clients face to face, and then come back to your to your cave, you know, so to speak, with your dual screens and all your all your, your gadgets that you need to really bunker down and get work done from home. So I'm all for it. I think it's great. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in, I, but I've always been a big believer in mixing things up. I was always doing a day from home or or two days from home uh, pre pre COVID as well. You know, so does that answer that question? I, I think it's I think it's a no brainer personally. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Uh, yeah. and when, when you buy exactly you know if if we actually had a proactive government we may have had some, some high speed trains already uh connecting yeah. you from the well imagine if you can have, live up at um Goulburn. Oh, Sarbo- no, oh, Goulburn. So right you right Goulburn and you can get from Goulburn to martin place in 45 imagine that living out yeah. at Goulburn, you get a, you get a half an acre there you got you know a couple of chickens the kids are running around <laughs> but you can still get into the cbd within 48 minutes yeah 45 minutes wouldn't that be a dream but the point is we, we we're slowly going that way i think yeah but, it's going to take time. No, it, it it's it's wild. It's I'm probably one of the last people that I ever that would ever consider, you know, moving far away from the city. I mean, you know, before before I became a father a couple of years ago, I was living literally in as you know, literally in the middle of the city. Um and now I now I now my kitchen and my living room overlook, you know, the harbor and the city and and the bridge. And I'm like right in the thick of it, right? So, yeah. so if I can't live in the middle of it, I want to at least look at it. Yeah, <laughs> right? got so, you, got you. so, so, so the fact that I'm sort of judging, you know, I'm I'm addicted to to being where where the the heart of everything is. And if someone like me is looking at other options out there, then I, you know, I, it's it's sort of 
a bit, as far as the litmus test goes, I think um, I, I just, even though you've got people like Elon Musk who are saying, you know, everyone has to come back into the office and things like that, you know, on the flip side, you've got Atlassian who are saying you don't have to come into the office, right? So for every tech company and for every sort of uh, employment environment that puts strict, uh, you know, requirements on people, there's just as many who don't. Yeah. And so in the war for talent, and it is a war for talent, in the war for yep. talent, um, yeah, I, I just, I keep looking at it and I keep thinking that it's sort of inevitable that uh, the change is, is here to stay. But all of that aside, mate, I'd love to talk uh, investment returns with you. I, I, you know, one of the things that you brought <laughs> up earlier was, you know, your, your clients know that every six to seven years, you're going to get a, a negative result. Yes. Um, we've seen, it, I, I think it was uh, the NASDAQ uh, is down, I think about 30%. Yep. Um, I can feel that pain as well. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Personally. Absolutely. And, Personally. And yeah. And and um, and you know, I was listening to something today, um, on the bloke that predicted, you know, that the, on the Big Short, it's the crazy guy who doesn't wear um, shoes. Uh, yeah, it's the Christian Bale character. That's, <laughs> that's that's exactly right. So it's the, the real guy. I can't remember his name, but um, you know, he's he's on Twitter and he talks about what he's doing next and. And, uh, and everything like that. And he seems to think that there's been a multiple compression. So, uh, which, which is a, you know, I, I guess a natural thing when there's fear in the market. So rather than paying 30 times, uh, you're paying 20 times instead because the multiple compressions. And so the next thing that's coming as per Christian Bale's character, the next thing that's coming is earnings compression. So he tends to think due to inflation, due to interest rates going up, less money being spent, companies are going to make less money. So he was sort of insinuating that perhaps we're only halfway through a collapse. That's a large insinuation because when you say companies, Absolutely. that is very open-ended, that is very subjective. You cannot tell me that every single company is going to be as interest rate sensitive as the next um agree uh, yeah i i don't i don't give that too much uh energy uh there's going no and i i'm with you as well like it's it it, it's it is there's so much noise in the market in terms of uh you know what's going to happen next how do you you know you've been doing this for quite a while yes how do do you handle these kind of conversations these days with clients yeah market volatility yeah and being in the middle of it yeah, cool. Um, I handle it quite well. Yeah, but then I've been doing it for 12 years, obviously come in post-GFC. Um, but I've seen enough now to understand that um, a good portion of this is money psychology and is is a mental game um, and is uh, is all uh, is hysteria and is is you know fear and greed. And I, I train my clients. I, I pre-position losses almost every single year. Uh, I'm consistently uh, underestimating and uh, sort of sort of painting a worse off picture than things uh, tend to be, and, and and getting them to understand that you're going to come in every five or six years, and I'm going to say, hey, Nancy, tough year this year. We've, as you know, we've done negative eight percent here, and and what I do in these periods of volatility is I really tilt the review meeting back around to education, and I help the client to remember that we can't be too short sighted here. If if you're looking at uh, Hyperion Australian Growth Fund giving us negative 17 mid June 2022. Well, hold on, I've got your report from when we caught up exactly 12 months ago, and and Hyperion was giving us positive 43. So <laughs> let's just understand that the good comes with the bad. Yes. And then um, I, I yeah I basically got them all covered off. There's not one client that's been overly concerned or worried. I think I awesome. haven't even picked up a client email yet. Um, I, during times of volatility, I tend to reach out a bit more than normal. Um, Capstone does provide a fairly good market update, which gives you some layman's terms type stuff. To, to uh, everyone, like uh, as sort of a, a, as a newsletter kind of thing? Uh, as, as a bulk X plan email yep. to my cool. OSA clients, my paying clients. Excellent. Uh, and but basically, I make sure that I understand what is happening and have a way to give them the two hour summary in, in five minutes or less. And I make sure I pre position that with all my, uh, in, in all my meetings, I actually give them the five minute summary. I sort of boil them down, if you want to call it that, so that they understand that, hey, my advisor knows what's going on. He understands the reason behind the volatility. Even if he can't change it, he understands the reason. 
And so I've talked them through the whole, you know, interest rate, uh, um, uh, inflation, cost of living change of conversation that took place around December last year. Because that, that conversation switched pretty quick from COVID to cost of living in a matter of weeks. Yeah. And then uh, before you knew it, the, all the FUD kicked in, the fear, the uncertainty and the doubt. And then that just all snowballed with with the with all the combination of the Ukraine war and, and the other macro factors. So I just keep my clients educated and I keep them in touch. And I even pull out seven year, 10 year, 20 year charts and say, go on, tell me when Brexit was. I want you to tell me because Brexit was scary. Remember Brexit? Oh, the UK is going to exit the <laughs> European Union. And the market was down for a good what, month and a half, two months. And clients were calling up and this and that. And you know, I did. I made I made my clients point out on the on the graph on the chart wh- when was Brexit, and nine out of ten got it wrong. Do you know why? Because it's irrelevant. Because it doesn't matter to them, and it won't matter in ten years time. Hundred percent. Little blip on the map, and only one client picked it correctly for 2016. All of them said, "Oh, was it 2000? Was it this one here, 2019?" Or and most of them picked the big COVID drop in March 2020. Because guess what? They got no idea because they're focused on enjoying retirement, enjoying their life enjoying their kids and just letting the market do its thing over time. That's awesome, man. So that's how um, I do it. Yeah, no, no, I love it. I, I love it. And, and for as um, for a stock standard, if you want to call it as that is for, for a financial planner, the confidence and I think the, the tactics and uh, the exercises that you put your clients through in terms of, hey, you tell me when the last thing happened. I think it's great. I haven't actually heard that one before. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that one. You always say, hey, remember when GST was introduced or when Trump got in, you know, all these, like I, I say, the, the World Towers went down, like all these things, you've been alive through all this. You, you know better than I do probably that these things are going to pop up. And I say, when this is all over, this, when this shit storms all over, guess what's going to happen? Sydney Morning Herald are going to come out and say, India and China are forming superpower. And that's going to be the next little thing we got to worry about. And it's just going to be something every single time. Because um, back in the day, you had to open up the paper and have a read of what was happening. And now it's Twitter, Facebook, Comsec, Tom Petrovsky, live feeds, Insta- Instagram feeds. Uh, you get a text from your mum's uncle, uh, market's going down. You, you find this information is, is very, very quickly dispersed and the level of hysteria is, is increased. Uh, you know, RBA shock market with $4 billion drop. No, it didn't really shock the market. Most people in their 60s know that rates have to go up because they went through that cycle. They've been through this cycle. Yes. Um, so I just try and use these examples to illustrate my point to clients. And when they hear these things, they go, well, Dylan, we know this is true already. Thank you for giving us that in, that, that confidence. So, that's awesome, man. No, no, I, uh, I love that. that. That's legitimately the best explanation of how I handle down markets that I've ever heard. So take my hat off to you, mate. Thank you. Um, all right, cool. So two more things. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, I want to cover like tech efficiencies, what you what what you've found over the years since since buying the practice and what you're up to now. And then the last, uh, we'll go into client acquisition and we'll get out of it. So number one, tech efficiencies, and you don't have to use specific uh, pieces of tech, but what are you finding right now? Yep. Or you can, but I don't mind. Uh, do whatever you like. But in terms of what are you finding right now has been the biggest bang for buck or best decision you've made in terms of tech and efficiencies over the last couple of years. Sure. Um, the biggest bang for buck, uh, this is going to be an obscure answer, is I can see so many advisors out there searching for the mecca, the holy grail of technology solutions and, 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 and band-aid solutions and just solutions in general. You're looking too hard. You don't have to have every single piece of tech on the market. The harder you search and the more you're trying to connect those puzzle pieces, you're actually going to do yourself a disservice. Mm. You know, we can be modern and be um, slick, uh, innovative advisors. We don't have to use every single piece of tech out there. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to drown yourself. <laughs> I'm telling you, um, it's okay to use some old school techniques for some things is it, if, if, if they work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but for me, uh, obviously using X-Plan, uh, it is mandated, but using X-Plan to the, to the fullest of its efficiencies. I know it's clunky. It's a love-hate relationship, but it does the job. Um, we've got uh, pre-COVID, we had about roughly 29% of our clients serviced by phone and video only. Um, we're now just just about to hit 40% video phone only, which is great. So clients, not only locally, but interstate uh, in Sydney, because uh, I'm, I'm in Wollongong. Yep. Uh, so just using, you know, as simple as it sounds, the free meetings, Teams meetings, and, and then the paid Zoom. I mean, it's really simple. Um, getting your other clients trained up on zoom so they feel comfortable logging in every if you see a client every six months maybe you do one zoom session and one face-to-face um we use calendly 
uh, I only use it, I don't use it in the way that most advisors use it. I only use it for my 30 minute filter phone calls. Um, I don't use it for review meetings because I, I like to stack my review meetings in a certain way. Yep. It's like custom way. Whereas a lot of other advisors, I know they, they, they're just happy to have the calendar open and they can just pick their slots. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm a little bit manual in that sense. I like to call yep. the client and lock them into when I want them in. Yes. Uh, obviously, LastPass, been using LastPass for years. Um, probably drowned without LastPass. <laughs> um, but realistically, um, what else is there, uh, Clay? What else do we use these days? Uh, obviously, yeah, got my got my webcam here and my, my speakers. I mean, you know, you don't really need a lot to run an efficient financial planning practice. You really don't. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. It's and you have clients that use that T word with you, and that T word is trust. And they say, Dylan, uh, it's great what you do for me. We love all this, we love all that, but we just ultimately trust you and we love you. Um, and you repay that honor by looking after them with everything you've got. It it really doesn't cost a lot of money to run a good financial planning business. That yeah, that's awesome, man. It's and 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 like I super respect that answer as well because yeah, obviously like tech, it, it, it is it's a in general, it's a talk about love hate. It, it 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 is a love hate, right? So, it I think I think it's a big investment. It's if you think about sort of like insurance, fund managers, platforms, and tech, they're they're kind of the four categories that you know, given an average piece of advice, it's sort of the four categories that you're going to touch on in terms of a, a, what you'd be a, a product provider. Mm. Um, insurance companies very easy to add in new ones into the panel or to interchange them because at the end of the day, it's, it is a, it's a commoditized product at the end of a recommendation. And, and e- each company is going to be different depending on what's best for the client. Fund managers, the same sort of, you know, every year, uh, you know, a fund manager or two or will, will sort of come in or drop out of, of, a, of a, you know, model portfolio or, 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 or a managed accounts uh, solution. And they're easy. Fund managers and, and insurance companies, easy to interchange mm. uh, platforms, investment platforms are a little bit harder. Um, typically, you know, especially if you're using it in front of a client, um, you're going to want to know where everything is. It's a, it's a proficiency exercise. So, mm. um, and an efficiency, so proficiency and efficiency exercise. So, um, it, but, but obviously just with the nature of how uh, advisors have moved from large practices to, oh, sorry, from large licensees to small licensees, it's been a, it's been an opportune time for, the independent uh, platforms to uh, to you know take market share, but in general, it 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 there's a, there's somewhat of an investment required on the advisor to consider swapping and changing. But with technology, that is that's a real investment. It's a real investment of time. Mm-hmm. It's a real investment of money. Um, it's a real investment of opportunity cost. And and so, what I've found is uh, tech. Um, is an enabler for sure. But if you drown in it, you end up not only where you started, but uh, in a worse position. So yep. it, it, it's kind of cool to hear, you know, like a, a younger guy like yourself, uh, you know, with, with a practice who who technically would be one of these, you know, innovative practices, but you're still talking about, hey, wait a second, like I don't have to use everything. Sometimes a phone call does the job yeah i think we put pressure on ourselves to use to use everything and and we see it from our peers because we're always sharing ideas and we're always trying to um find better ways of doing things but sometimes like like you say like if a no change ROA takes me 90 seconds to do is there any merit in me outsourcing that 90 second uh, no change no. i think someone on xy this wasn't me someone said if it takes five minutes or less do it but the same applies for technology if if, if it's just a quick thing like there's no rule. There's a solution, but it's a nice to have, not a need to have. Yeah. Uh, the best bang for buck, sorry, would be Microsoft 365. Uh, we keep all our files on that on that server. Uh, yep. And once it goes into its final folder, it's called filing or to be filed. Yep. That goes to XPlan, then we never see the file again. Um, nice. That's about 50 bucks a month. Yeah. And um, HelloSign, which is a cheaper version of DocuSign, which I think is better. Yep. We've been using that for, uh, for, gosh, maybe seven years now. Um, that cost me about so 200 bucks a year. And that is a uh, godsend. Client doesn't need to sign in. They can sign on their phone. They can type. They can sign. They can use laptop. I've got 97% of clients on HelloSign. Amazing. Yeah. Best that, that, bank about those two I should have mentioned before. Sorry. Yeah, that's awesome. And then uh, and then the last question is um, is client acquisition. So obviously, you know, you're, you're a lifestyle business. So you're not, you're not 
you know, massively focused on client acquisition, as would say a, a ravenous growth company would be. But I'm still interested. You mentioned you got some inter- interstate clients, right? Uh, so ob- obviously, obviously, there is some level of client acquisition that's still going on. Yep. Um, what What are you finding works well for you, and what doesn't? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll say I'll give you three points here. Um, first one, I've been very, 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 very selective of who I take on as a new OSA or ongoing service client uh, in the last. Uh, oh, I didn't make the cut for the record. Uh, you, you did yeah. my insurance. Said you went, mate. Yeah. That that's that's that's. Well, I was yeah. I'm a, <laughs> last four years, I'm, I've been very conscious about how, uh, which OSA clients we take on and, and how many for, for different reasons. Uh, well, and the second point is I don't uh, I don't provide advice to family or friends any longer. I've done that a few times in the past, and um, and it's a great debate on X Y, isn't it? Really, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but it it just has never worked for me, and it just has come back to be not a good feel or a good situation. Uh, yeah. I've got one, my best friend. I, I still look after him, insurance and super, and I'm just about to turn him pro bono in November, so I'm still going to look after him as per. A normal review cycle, be there for him, hold, hold his hand, be there for his family because I love him to death. Yes. But I don't want to charge him anymore. That's my own personal decision. Yep. Uh, but he provides ad hoc sort of IT help to me. So it's kind of a, a really nice synergy. But cool. um, so I've only added, I only added two new OSA clients in the last 12 months. Wow. They were quality. They were quality, but I, and I let go of about eight. Wow. Yep. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, uh, X, Y, and I've been trimming down for about three years. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you know, with the commercial aspect of financial planning costs going up, you just can't keep a client that's paying you 800 bucks a year anymore. God, no. You just can't. No. Uh, and that's, that number's a lot higher as well. Yes. Uh, so I've let go of six, yeah, six, seven, eight clients. Uh, I'm very mm. comfortable with that. I've got yeah. two more to trim down this next 12 months. Wow. And then there's no more tr- trimming, so to, so to speak. It'll just be adding the, the ones that I want at the right time. Um, what's working for me? I don't advertise. I don't pay for marketing. I don't pay for anything. I have my Google Maps, my Google reviews. Yep. I've got 30, 36 five star reviews. Number two in Illawarra. Uh, that generates that generates um, all of my inquiries plus word of mouth from existing clients and, and family of existing clients. And I'm just I'm still very selective with who I take on. It's a it's a it's an email. Um, they've got to go through the website. Yep. Put through their little five question sort of questionnaire on the website. Yep. I, don't take, I don't take calls. I don't. I screen all my calls. Um, if they leave a voicemail saying, "Hey, I'm looking to revise," I say, "Here's a website link." That's the first process. Yep. If I think I can help them from that little snippet of information, I'll send them my six steps to financial foundations for thirties, twenties, and families. That's awesome. Um, the link to my thirty-minute filter phone call, uh, and I'll explain them that to them that, that the phone call is for me to find out a bit more about what what, what they're about, what they want, what they need. Um, help them understand what the financial planning process is like. And more importantly, if we're going to be a good fit. And I've got two business rules. Um, if I don't think I can make a genuine f- positive financial impact on their journey or make or actually add value to their financial journey, I'll tell them that and I'll say, I'm not the right person for you. You need to see this person, that person, or you're not quite ready for advice. Uh, email me in 12 months. From the from the filter phone call, if it's a good fit and I think I can help them in some way, shape, or form, I'll explain what our discovery meeting looks like. It's a two-hour Q and A concept goal setting session, very in depth, very personal. I charge three hundred and seventy five dollars for the one off consultation. If we go to advice, I scrap the three seventy five. It's more of a barrier, more of a more of a you know yeah a blocker. And um, if if they just need that one off session for some general sort of information, some high level general sort of advice, they might just be on their way, and I'm comfortable with that. And then that's that. Dude, that sounds so uh, relaxed, confident, and um, sustainable. Sustainable, yeah. It took me a while to get there. Uh, I started introducing the fee for the first meeting in 2017, and it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. That's awesome, man. And I tell clients specifically, because I can see I've got three young kids, I could take on heaps more clients, but I choose not to. And I specifically tell them it's the opposite effect. You know the opposite effect? Yeah. I say, I say you, almost, you don't want their business and they come flocking to you. I say, yeah. I say, I, I could take on so much more clients, but I'll be cutting corners either yes. unintentionally or intentionally. Yes, yes, yes. If I work for you, I'd be providing you with dog shit. Yes, dog yes. Shit, dog input in. Yeah. Out, out, 
Yeah. Uh, and that's the sort of advice I am. I'd rather take an extra sec- a second meeting with you, a third meeting with you. Yeah. Extra couple of hours with you uh, and, and to take less profit and, and take on five, six less clients. And when you tell them that, they come running to you. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, or, or when you say, look, uh, like, I know I can help you, but, it's, you know, I can't start for this, this many weeks or, you know, I just want to make sure, like, I, I'm going to take this really slow. Most advisors will do this in eight weeks. I need, like, 14 weeks. They, like, come running back to you. It's like the opposite. It's the weirdest thing. It is weird, man. But, uh, I mean, it all makes sense at the same time. I'll tell you what's super interesting. Our, chair, um, our chairman, Roxy, is currently today – because he has another company called Lydian that does uh, mortgages. And um, he's currently out at Sydney Olympic Park because have you ever heard of Pepper Mortgages, like Pepper yes, Bank? Yes, yes. So they each year they look for um, a, a mortgage company that's doing good work, you know, for, for community and, and charity. And so he's, he's winning an award today um, because they allocate a small amount for every mortgage that goes through to building uh, water wells in uh, these, you know, like uh, disadvantaged communities o- overseas. Yes. And uh, so he's winning an, an award, his Pepper, Pepper Money Award. Um, and one of the things that it just dawned when you said, you know, I charge 375 but then I refund it to them anyway kind of thing because it, it's not really about the money. It, it dawned on me that um, Benny Nash does a fee up front in the same way that you do but he puts it all to, he donates it. yeah, he yeah. donates it. Yeah. So like, uh, it, it, you know, if, if, um, I don't know if that's relevant or not, but it, it basically, and, and look, we at XY, we don't do anything. So it, I'm, I'm not sort of speaking from, uh, from personal experience, but it is something that it's kind of one of those things that is a nice to have, and you'd like to set it up. Um, but the way that you described it, it I, I literally thought you were going to say at the end and, and, and we donate it. Um, but I guess the only reason I'm really bringing it up is because it's so topical at the moment with Roxy being, uh, winning an award. And really why I'm really bringing it up is Clayton, we really need to be doing this at X. <laughs> so I'm telling you, but I'm really telling yeah, myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think clients, clients just see through bullshit so quickly and so easily. Yeah. Um, and if you're genuine and you, and you, and it sounds weird, but I mean, I, I do swear sometimes in meetings because yeah. I think when you swear, provided you don't upset the client and you know, the client can handle it. Yeah. You, you are providing impact and you are actually showing some genuine, genuine passion. And clients can normally see that authenticity and can say, can see he's actually telling us the truth. Here. He's telling us like it, it checks out, you know, he's not in a fancy office. He's got yeah. three kids. like he checks yeah. out that he doesn't take that many clients on. He's selective about who takes on and why he takes them on. And that actually want, makes him want to come back even more. Yeah. So it's more of a, it's, it just worked in my favor that, that I've just, I've got this little spiel that I give and, but it actually is very, very true. And it seems to have them flocking back, um, um, even if it's just you know for, for little bits and pieces of work. So, dude, it's awesome. I, I like. Uh, I, there was a couple of things that I'm pumped to hear. There was a couple of things that um, you surprised me with in terms of you know your approach to tech and things like that. But all in all, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure getting the chance to catch up cool. with you again, sort of touch base for the first time, I guess, in a couple of years with COVID and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, Mate, thank you for sharing with uh, the XY listener. It's 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 quite large these days. You know, uh, the podcast gets. I think I mentioned we've had five hundred podcasts in Australia, Crazy. let alone around the world. Um, and uh, and yeah, we we get like twenty thousand downloads a month these days, which is just wild, right? Like that's more advisors than there are in the industry. Yep. in Australia. So crazy. Yeah, so so. Um, as someone who has uh, certainly been there since day one of the journey, it's awesome to catch yeah. up and speak to it you. Man. So thank you. Great. It almost went too fast. We could just be talking for hours. I'm always happy to share, even on the forums and on the page. You know, I'm a big sharer. So totally. I'm, an over, I'm an oversharer, though. You know, I'm always. Well, I've I got a question. How do you keep? How do you keep that hairline? No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it's it's going to it's receding very quickly, and the grace <laughs> is kicking in very quickly. I'll be 34 next year. So God I can help. see that. Oh my God. Oh, big man. All right. Well, great to catch up. And I really appreciate your time, man. Appreciate yours as well. You take care and uh, you you keep keep looking as young as you are and you'll be uh, leaving us all for dead. (laughs) Cheers, buddy. See you, mate. Bye.